today we are going to talk about um, how security evolves with your Kubernetes footprint. And um, for that, I would like to give like an introductory example. And um, with this example, I'd like to start um, looking into yeah, how, how do organizations typically look like? Um, I will make some uh, assumptions here, but this is uh, generally true from what I've seen with our customers. Um, the main thing is that there's one organization usually that has a, a number of teams, and those teams are usually um, very diverse. So there's different positions inside a team, and the teams are quite autonomous. So different teams can make different infrastructure des uh, decisions on their own without necessarily going into the um, whole organizational structure and um, asking other teams for permission or asking other teams um, if they are allowed to do this. And um, in this scenario, we can now imagine quite easily that um, one team, for example, in, in this case, Team Alpha decides, hey, let's try out Kubernetes. Like, it's a very cool technology. We have some experience. Let's just try it out. And they start using Kubernetes clusters in their environments. They maybe switch their production to uh, Kubernetes. And they're quite autonomous, so they can do whatever they want. And next up, Team Omega maybe has the same idea, but it's like on a totally different end of the um, organization. And therefore, both teams don't know each other really well or at all. And both decide, they, let's try Kubernetes out and let's give it a shot. And from then, um, Team Alpha realizes, wow, Kubernetes is actually pretty neat. So they expand their Kubernetes uh, usage. Maybe instead of like having one application production, they move all their applications and production to Kubernetes. Um, so there's quite a growth in Team Alpha now. But um, Team Omega decides, hey, we could, we could just share, right? Um, so Team Omega and Zeta decide, like, let's share our cluster. Because Team Zeta doesn't want to start out. They don't want to deal with cluster setup. They don't want to get into it too much. They just want to use Kubernetes. So Team Omega gracefully decides, like, hey, we can, we can share our cluster with you, and we can use it together, and this will be this will be great. And then finally, Team Beta joins in, and they don't care about what anything anyone else is doing inside the organization, and just decide, like, we also want to use Kubernetes. So they start using Kubernetes right away without any second thought, um, totally isolated. Now, now what happens next is a, a very interesting problem. And the problem is uh, we need to apply a security patch. And as you've seen, all the teams now have different Kubernetes cluster. There's no oversight uh, about like where are these security patches applied? Were they even applied? Every team can do it differently. And um, there's really no control if, like, for example, team beta decides like we're not going to roll out this Kubernetes patch. We have such a small Kubernetes cluster. We're not going to do it. And um, suddenly, you reach a point where you basically like this dog sitting there and just thinking, it's fine. Security is just going to be fine. But you have no mechanisms to apply security across clusters. You have no oversight. And you have a completely different security baseline across your entire organization that now suddenly becomes very hard to fix this issue or to even attempt to change this issue after the fact. So what I want to do now is basically take you through a journey of how you could, from a start point, um, reimagine the story and imagine it in a way that would work out and make the whole end result much nicer to use and also much easier um, yeah, for uh, security to really be a big part of. And for that, we obviously want to start out uh, with a single team, so you've just decided to use Kubernetes. You're hopefully the first adopter of Kubernetes in your organization. And there, starting out, I would like to emphasize just immediately use the basics. What do I mean by the basics? For me, the basics are these three points. RBAC, which is um, admission control. So the uh, access control, sorry. Um, so it's control plane API interaction uh, gets managed through uh, RBAC. And this is well documented. It's just enabled through a flag in your API server. And you should just have it enabled and enforce any service port, whatever, on your uh, cluster to use RBAC to have some control over uh, control plane API interaction so that you know who's making calls to the API server. You can control it. And if you have a malicious actor in one of the pods, the blast radius is very limited. Additionally, PSP, so um, pod security policies. 
These really control what your pods are allowed to do on a node, for example. Are they allowed to mount some volumes? Are they even allowed to, to mount an empty deal? Um, are they allowed to have root privileges? All this stuff is kind of defined in a PSPs. And here it is quite important to, to have a default PSP that is very restricting. So any pod that doesn't require any extra permissions just doesn't have any extra permissions. And it's really crucial that you use this and therefore that there's really no excuse to not use it here. It's in my opinion pretty basic by now because of how well documented and how well understood it is for single cluster environments. And then the last but not least, um, network policy is where you can control ingress and egress communication of your pods and you can really nail down like which traffic is, uh, is allowed to go where. There's also different tools here. They're all pretty well understood, so I'm not going to bore you with the additional details here now. Um, but what would be important is you also have a default network policy, which is basically extremely restricting. Um, because if you do that, then you basically force any other um, user of the cluster to clearly state their network policies. Um, now, obviously, these are well understood, but sometimes people need additional motivation. Um, developers can be sometimes hard to motivate to even adopt these, in my opinion, rather um, basic security uh, uh, features of Kubernetes. And um, therefore, it can be positive to, to, to just show them there are positives beyond just security in these uh, different measures. For example, they give insights on expected application behavior. For example, if I know that there are certain network policies set, then I know which services may be uh, supposed to communicate with uh, a different service or how they are supposed to communicate, which network ranges are they communicating in. And that then makes debugging easier if I have a problem on the cluster. In the same vein, if I have to specify RBAC rules or have to specify RBAC permissions, then it becomes easier to go to what will happen if the master go down, how many services will be impacted, because I know which services are actually um, talking directly to the master. And then I can have a better idea of like what impact is maybe an incident having, what impact is maybe my uh, maintenance having if I, for some reason, have to take the master down. So there's positives beyond just security. And then um, I want to now, throughout this uh, talk, I want to start building a security checklist. Um, this checklist will be shared um, uh, in like a more detailed form and a more full form um, in the follow-up to this webinar, but I now just want to build it up to kind of uh, create awareness of what we talked about, what we uh, have collected so far. And obviously the first step would be like the Kubernetes and native security, which is RBAC, uh, a default restricted uh, pod security policy and a default maybe deny all network policy. From here, um, we now go into, even if you're just a single team, you should start automating as early as possible. What, is, what does that mean? Um, there are some areas now in your CI CD pipeline for security minded people or for general security, where um, you can start automating very early on and it will have big benefits to you later on. What are some of these uh, possibilities? Like dependency updates. Don't do your dependency updates manually. Try to utilize automation to find new releases of your dependencies to really enable you to make it extremely easy to be on the latest, most secure versions of your dependencies. Additionally, enforce security in CI CD by uh, scanning for vulnerabilities. This can be done on different layers, and I will show this in a minute. But um, really automate this early on. Um, and last but not least, also automate cluster creation. We talked about the default uh, Kubernetes features, which make your cluster more secure. And the creating a secure cluster for anyone in your organization should be the easier thing to do. It should be harder to create an insecure cluster than it is to create a yeah, secure cluster. Basically, you want everyone that wants to start out to immediately go, I want to create a secure cluster because it's easier for myself. Therefore, you need to automate this secure cluster creation and having a cluster creation where the output is instantly a, in your organization's mind, secure cluster. So let's talk a little bit about how we do it. Um, this is a bit how Giantstorm does it internally. And sometimes I will also talk about how we do it um, with customers. 
But um, here for giant small internally, we have our code on GitHub. And for um, dependency updates, we use Dependerbot. So it supports multiple languages, which is very good for us. And it also supports um, Docker, for example, Golang, which are basically the main things we use it for, but also GitHub Actions, for example. So there's a lot of um, things Dependerbot um, does by now. And it really produces minimal effort to keep your dependencies up to date. How does it work? I've pasted an example config here for Dependerbot. So we have a package ecosystem, for example, Docker uh, and line three. Uh, the default uh, directory is here, the, the very top layer directory of our repository. And in there will be a Docker file. And now Dependerbot will check on the target branch, mad, target branch master. Every day at 4 a.m. it will check, is there any new Docker version or any new um, image that is maybe referenced by this Docker file, which I can update? And if there is, Dependerbot will simply um, create a pull request replacing this version with a newer version. And in this pull request, it will then ping the reviewers. And we can just say, yeah, cool, works. Our CI went through, just merge it, and we have everything up to date. We don't need to have awareness that there was a new release. We don't need to actively watch out, but it just exists. We just need to merge it. In the same uh, sense, also for Golang, it's the same kind of game, right? So um, all our Go uh, dependencies are updated in the same way. Um, from here, we can now also look at um, scanning uh, code dependencies for vulnerabilities. Um, most vulnerabilities are not directly in your code, but are, or most known vulnerabilities are not directly in your code, but are in code that you depend on. So some dependencies, maybe even um, some further out dependencies have some vulnerability, and you need to really be careful to not include these vulnerabilities in your imports. Um, for this, we use Nancy, which is uh, um, based on the Sonar type OSS index for vulnerabilities. And Nancy runs an our CICD pipeline and checks against this um, open source uh, um, vulnerability index um, and checks all our Go dependencies basically in CICD um, in every run. You can see here a little screenshot of our um, Circle CI pipeline running Nancy. On the next layer, we obviously also have our Docker images, um, even though maybe our Docker images are up to date uh, because we use Dependerbot. Maybe some Docker images um, we use still contain uh, vulnerabilities. And for this, we use uh, Claire on Quay. Um, so Quay.io is our default Docker image registry. And um, Quay has built uh, Claire, which is, um, um, yeah, vulnerability checker that runs against any image on Quay, and then outputs basically which vulnerabilities are here. And one example I wanted to just include here is an example of the Claire run on etcd version 3.4.4. So not the oldest etcd version, but not the newest etcd version either. And here we can see that there is a whole bunch of vulnerabilities and one high-level vulnerability and 19 low-level vulnerabilities. Using the latest version then obviously removes the high-level vulnerability and also reduces the level of low-level vulnerabilities. But um, this is mainly for us to really have an automated way that is easily expandable. Basically, any image that gets pushed into Quay is checked by Claire and reports back to us if there were any vulnerabilities. So very straightforward, very nice um, to include and very easy to use. And finally, we obviously get to cluster creation. This is a little bit in, in conjunction with our customers and with our business um, as we uh, yeah, give you a managed Kubernetes solution. We obviously manage cluster creation as well. Um, and in our clusters, we follow these first Kubernetes guidelines I, I mentioned. So there's a network policy, the uh, deny all network policy. There's a very strict um, PSP. Um, additionally, there's like um, um, security essential updates to components like Kubernetes, etcd, as you just saw before. We take care of updating all these components as well as Calico if it's running. Um, all of these things are taken care of by us and we also run CIS benchmark uh, scans against our clusters that are created to really check if everything is kind of in order. Um, but the main benefit here would be by making it easy to create secure clusters, 
we make it easy across providers, which is like AWS, Azure, and on-premise, you kind of use the same API, you have a similar interface, and the clusters that are created are all compliant to the same um, security standards as any cluster on any other provider. So that's one of the main benefits. Now solving this uh, for our security pipeline, we can again note this down in our security checklist. This is still in a single team context, so one team could use this and really build up their pipeline. Um, and in the next stage, we really want to make sure to not do it all ourselves. So it might be convenient to also hack together some bash scripts or to not run a security scanner, but build your own stuff um, because you think you can build this, uh, a better solution or um, something like that. But there are many security solutions out there by now. And it is crucial that you use them. Do not try to build your own security infrastructure uh, at this point, in my opinion, because your footprint is still relatively small if you're a single team adopting Kubernetes. And establishing a managed solution is way easier than building up a very custom, very big um, infrastructure here, especially thinking about it in the way that you also want to focus on your main business. You don't want to only work on security for Kubernetes. Um, at least as long as that's not your main business, um, you don't want to do that. Um, so choose your battles wisely. And uh, there are many other things to work on. Security should be a preference or a, a, yeah, a value, but make sure to make educated decisions and really use the tools that are available. So now from a single um, team point of view, we can say, okay, single team can be fine. Um, we have a small pipeline set up. But what do we do now? So multiple teams will maybe join later on or uh, want to join. And that's the first major difficulty, in my opinion, which is not easy to solve at all, which is finding other Kubernetes users in your organization. Um, this might sound obvious at first, but it's a real problem. Your organization might be very big. It might be very segregated between teams. And just finding out if there's other teams in your organization which use Kubernetes can be nearly impossible. So in this presentation, I will go from the um, ideal case. And the ideal case would be you find them very early on in the adoption process. So you have built up your, your pipeline right now, your security you know, pipeline, which involves some tooling, which has some um, you know, basic pract best practices on how secure your clusters should be. And um, now finding these other people happens very early on, so they haven't built anything, and you can kind of work together with them. Um, I know this is not always the case, but let's assume for now. So once you find other teams, the most important thing to do is enable other teams to reuse your work. You've built a certain set of security automation, and you want the security automation to be reusable, and to be reused by these other teams. So they can inherit your, inherit your advancements and your built-in automation. Um, this means that also when they inherit your automation, they inherit your already existing security compliance. Um, this doesn't mean that every team has to use the same pipeline. This doesn't mean that every team has to use the same Kubernetes cluster. This just means that the automation is at a point where it's reusable it's getting standardized between teams, and teams can easily reuse this. Again, how, how do we uh, do this in Giant Swarm? Because we essentially have the same problem with multiple teams across our, that, that do multiple tasks in our organization, and we somehow need to keep them in sync, and we somehow need to keep them together on the same level of security. And what we have started doing is um, we have started integrating with uh, CircleCI Ops. Um, because we are Circle CI users, so our CI CD runs on Circle CI. And there we try to do not repeat ourselves through the Circle CI ops. And ops are basically executors, jobs, uh, or, or basic tasks which run in your CI CD pipeline. And you can build an op, and that op is then shareable between pipelines. So we use actually the same op in all of our projects. Every project, every Go project, every major project we build uses this one op. And this op um, 
contains these vulnerability scanners. So it will run Nancy. It will run uh, different other scanners, for example, Helm um, linting. It will run all kinds of security-related tooling. And how to include it is made very easily. So uh, we have really put an emphasis on making it easy to use. So everything to use our op in our context to build a Go project and build also uh, um, the Docker image out of this Go project is these lines you see here. So all there is is we reference the orbs, we, we call our orb that um, we use for building architect. And then we have a workflow where there's just a job defined, which is a go build. The name is just go build. It's just a name you can give to a, any job. And um, the binary output in this uh, case should be KVM operator. A resource class is how big the machine should be that is building our go binary. So as you can see, we made it very easy to include, and we made a, a, a point out of including these security features in this orb so that every Go build we run in our organization automatically runs our security tooling to make sure that really everyone is using it and it's very easy to use. Additionally, there are some things that you can't just re replicate by um, orbs or by socket CI ops. And whenever we run into this problem, we use code generation heavily. So we have built our own command line tool, um, a Go command line tool, which supports um, yeah, code generation when we cannot use ops. This is used, for example, for dependent bot configs because you can't easily generate those uh, or, or create those across all your repositories. Um, you don't want them to get out of sync and so on. So we have built an uh, uh, easy CLI where you can just generate those. Um, additionally, GitHub Actions is another problem or make files in some repositories. So what we really made a point out of to make it easy and reproducible to just have aligned these different files and these different configurations that are also security relevant across all our um, repositories by just putting them into code generation and having one aligned code generation tool. And here you can see just the help text output uh, where you can see it's very easy to run. So it would be just dev CTL gen, and then for example, depender bot, and it would generate all the depender bot configs I would need, for example, for a Go project. Um, and this becomes very um, straightforward then. A developer can run it on his machine, or a, uh, a CI can check if the um, generated configs are correct. That's once again how, how we do it. Um, and the image we end up in then is that you have security in your pipeline deeply ingrained. And this security um, or these security pieces are shareable between different pipelines. So each team can have its own source, its own build, its own test, its own deployment. But these components, which are security relevant, are shared between all pipelines between those teams so that you really focus on having reusable components. And by now, there's many solutions out there that enable you to do this. But especially in the Kubernetes world, where the infrastructure and everything around it is so vast and can get very complex if you use many security scanners, it is important to also take some load of the individual teams and really supply them with easy to use tooling and easy to um, adopt security best practices uh, where they don't have to spend a, a large amount of effort just to be security compliant. So we can again check, uh, add this to our security checklist, um, have some common static code analyzers, have shared uh, CI steps. Um, runtime compliance is something we did not really touch on here. It is something you should consider. There are many managed solutions out there, also like open policy agent to just um, check like admission control a bit more or webhooks. Um, but talking about this in this frame would really <laughs> blow up the whole presentation. So I've left it out here. Um, if you're interested, feel free to ask questions about this as well. Um, and then uh, runtime vulnerability checking and using code generation, uh, generation where necessary or possible. So to really make it easy for your developers or other teams to inherit all your security advancements and to make progress easily. And from here, we now get to the next big point, which is, yes, we have now had some 
um, tooling that is maybe shared between teams. And we had some um, reusable um, security compliance. But one of the most important points in any larger communication uh, organization, especially related um, to Kubernetes security, is to establish communi communication channels between those different teams. So there needs to be a space for inter-team communication. All the tooling in the world doesn't help us if there's no communication between teams and if there's no communication on security topics between teams, especially having a shared vision between teams where security is going. Um, on the one hand, it, if you have a shared vision, it becomes much easier for other teams to just join this shared vision and align with your already existing security um, advancements, security ideas, security tooling, because they can then adopt this vision and really align to this vision. Additionally, if you don't have a shared vision and you don't have communication, security issues can get dropped. Every team would have to do without any communication or without any shared vision. Every team has to do its own research to find new vulnerabilities, its own research to find new security advancements. You make really your life a lot easier if you have a shared vision and a shared communication platform where you can, in your organization, talk about security and really push security advancements in multiple teams at once. Now, again, how do we manage this in our um, company as, as a giant swarm? And there we have a SIG security or Kubernetes security um, where the SIG is basically um, constructed out of team members which are somehow security interested. I assume that anyone that's joining a, a webinar like this has some security interest, especially Kubernetes security interest. Um, so you would be people that join this um, special interest group uh, security. This is kind of modeled to the upstream Kubernetes um, um, special interest groups, where it's across teams, basically a, a meeting or um, yeah, yeah, just a SIG that meets regularly and discusses security, that creates a shared vision for security and shares information between teams on security. So that then individual tasks that are security related, like we want to include a new security scanner, we want to include a new static scanner, can be distributed to different teams. So not one team has to implement everything and push it out to different teams, but since every team most likely has someone that has some security um, interest and is joining the SIG, this can then be distributed out to these different teams. And then I also want to show briefly um, how Giant Swarm um, has or, or works in relation to, to customers. So how we um, also have um, some security impact on our customers and some security discussions there. Um, so first of all, obviously, um, the top two teams are our organization uh, our, our customer teams. Now, this is a, an organization which is uh, using Giant Swarm as their managed uh, Kubernetes provider. So we manage their Kubernetes clusters. But most likely, um, or hopefully, this organization also has some kind of security channel. We can't dictate what that looks like. This can be a security department. This can be just a security person. This can be a structure like a SIG security that we have. But um, for generality, I'm just going to reference it here as a, a security channel. And with the security channel, we then have a direct communication where we forward to them or to our customers security crucial information. Like, for example, if there's a new Kubernetes patch, we usually go through it and check for any CVEs that got fixed, any CVEs that came out. and and then urge our customers to upgrade or tell them how, what our uh, severity of the CVE or the impact of the CVE is on their clusters or their particular use case. As well as the other way around, uh, customers obviously can also inform us um, of security um, related topics, maybe some things they noticed where we could improve or where they would like to improve or their, they would like their clusters to improve. And for that, um, we also have like a weekly or bi-weekly meeting with the solution engineer and the customer to really have this like a two-lane road where they can give us input as well as we can give them informational input 
and um, have a, also a, a shared Slack channel. So there's loads of communication possibilities here. Now, we have discussed a single team having a security uh, pipeline. We have discussed sharing those pipelines between teams and also building up uh, a communication guideline or a communication channel between teams, which could be a SIG, which could be some other form of communication um, that aligns teams on these communication topics across their team boundaries uh, and specifically uh, in regards to uh, Kubernetes security. And the next challenge then becomes to, to grow um, security processes. And here my advice would be, or my advice what I've seen work very well in the past and also in our own company is to grow these security processes naturally, okay? If you are maybe a security advisor or something like that, and you just write down all these security processes, in my opinion, you will have a hard time adopting them if they are not lived out of necessity and if the baseline structure of communication doesn't exist already. Um, so having this communication layer and this uh, uh, channel will help you grow these processes more naturally. And CVE notifications, for example, if you use a special interest group, will be shared out automatically. And then you can just write down the process you've already adopted, as well as security change communication. Like if one team has made a security advancement because all the teams use similar or the same security um, or reuse the same security tooling, there's an automatic need for this change communication that you can then turn into a process. So growing this naturally with necessity of course, it doesn't uh, always work out 100%, but this is a way to really make it easier to adopt these. And if you continue to use automation throughout your organization and throughout your security um, process, then you will realize that growing it naturally will become quite easy. And the next bonus on this is obviously, if you ever have a security audit, um, like uh, an ISO audit or something similar. What auditors, in, in my experience at least, really look for is they want to see that you're actually living the process. It doesn't matter if you've just written down all the process notes and all the different ways how the process should be handled. But then as soon as the auditor asks for an, for an instance where you have used these processes and you can't show them any instance or you have to come up with an obviously fake instance of um, using this uh, security process, the auditor will not be very impressed with your performance in the audit. Um, but by growing these processes naturally and basically having these processes in place already, um, you can point the auditors to potentially tens or hundreds of examples where you have maybe made a change in your security pipeline, where you have maybe shared the, the CVE knowledge between teams and really across your entire organization and followed this process. And then the rest of the conversation becomes a lot easier in my um, opinion, because the auditor most likely feels like you've understood what you're doing and why you're doing it. You're not doing it to please the auditor, you're doing it because you've understood um, what it's all about. And now we can of course put this in our security checklist. So we talked about native security for Kubernetes, uh, security pipeline, security alignment across your organization, um, basically reusing pieces of your pipeline, and now security governments, which is um, establishing a security com a communication channel in your organization, and then establishing these processes like a CVE process, um, notification policies on changes in your security pipeline, which we've built up across our organization now. And from here, we are basically at the point now we have multiple teams in our organization these multiple teams all use Kubernetes and they are now expanding out. More and more teams are joining in. So your Kubernetes footprint is starting to grow even more and it's starting to grow past this. Just a few teams are using it, but really multiple teams are using it. Instead of, using, uh, instead of having maybe one to five Kubernetes clusters, you're now at the stage of like 10 to 100 maybe. And um, at this point, you really end up at the point like, what's next? How can I continue to improve? And here there are some sobering realities, unfortunately, I have to tell you. Um, more clusters 
uh, unfortunately cause more problems. So security is not somehow solved eventually. You won't get into a state where you have all these clusters running and you don't have to worry about security ever again. Um, there is really no such magic bullet. There's no managed solution you can use that solves all your, uh, all your security needs. There's always going to be a need to communicate in your um, organization to improve um, security in your organization, and especially in a landscape like Kubernetes that is continuously growing now um, and changing and evolving over its lifespan, it becomes important that to realize that continue to automate because it will be your strongest weapon and there's no other way to solve this issue at scale. You need automation. You need to continue to focus on automation. If you do not do this, and start introducing too many manual processes or start losing this communication between teams, it becomes very difficult if you continue to scale up. Um, and for this, I also wanted to introduce that maybe streamline incident workflows. Um, this now goes more in the direction of SecOps, where previously we were maybe more in the um, DevSec environment, where we were more on the developer point of view, building up CI, CD pipelines and managing all that. We're now at the other end of the spectrum, where we, when we arrive at a certain scale, we run into serious issues um, where we cannot handle maybe all the minor security incidents or policy violations that are happening across all our clusters. Um, and there you really need to work on streamlining these workflows and making the operation side as good or even better than the DevSec side. Um, Ways to do this is, for example, introduce playbooks on handling uh, security incidents. So it doesn't need to be only playbooks for um, ops uh, uh, incidents. What, what do I mean by a playbook? Uh, a playbook is um, basically a run through of, um, yeah, um, some incident happened and then you have pre-written steps on how to resolve the incidents, uh, very specific to these incidents or uh, pre-written steps on how to communicate what is happening to maybe different parties inside your organization. Um, and here I can really show how, how we um, take care of this. Um, so we have named our playbooks um, Ops Recipes. And um, this has really been something we've been working with our customers and we've been trying to introduce, um, work on or improve with our customers. And I assume every <laughs> customer that uh, we've worked with knows that we have some ops recipes and we have some postmortems, and they have heard this and they receive RCAs. And now I want to quickly explain what each of those are. So an, an ops recipe is, uh, is your basic playbook. So we have metrics and alerts that are not only um, ops related, but also security related. And ops recipes are basically um, the guideline on how to re either resolve this um, incident or on how to communicate that this incident is happening and collect the correct information when this um, uh, incident is happening. So it really streamlines for the first responder the actions he has or she has um, to do at this point. Um, and then a postmortem is basically the state after the incident. So a postmortem is a structured report of the aftermath that is written down once the incident is mitigated. And the main goal of a postmortem is to find a root cause and find additional mitigations or improvement we can make long term, both on an ops side of view and also on a security point of view. And customers often come in contact with these uh, postmortems when they are shared um, in the form of root cause analysis. If something really went fast and uh, we need to share some root cause uh, analysis with our customers or we want to share some then um, this postmortem gets transformed into a root cause analysis and presented to the customer in a digestible uh, view. And here at the bottom, I also wanted to quickly show um, what this looks like in our Slack, for example. So this is an alert that is firing. Um, it's not very uh, crucial, but um, might have some security implementation uh, and implication as well. Basically, the system D unit, um, which is updating the UTMP, is not running anymore and um, this has triggered an alert on our side and in this alert you can see okay there's a, a link to the ops recipe so you could just click the ops recipe button and you would re uh, you could see the full list of like these other to-dos 
um, when you encounter this issue. Um, resolve it like this, write down this, um, inform these people. That's basically the content here. Then you have linked postmortems. Um, so are there already open postmortems or postmortems that have already been resolved related to this alert? Could this be a resurgence of the same problem? And then you can um, basically reread the same uh, um, already happened incidents and maybe check if the root cause also applies to you right now. And this is very crucial also for security incidents because if you have a list of, hey, this has already happened before, and we have, we have <laughs> had this uh, as a, uh, with our customers. If you see, hey, this had this security impact before, and you have a list of postmortems that show that which security impact it had, you can quickly and way quicker mitigate that the same security impact will not happen again in this incident. Um, this especially happened to us with customers where we had a security incident previously at a different customer, and now we see the same symptoms in the customer that's currently um, triggering or um, alerting, and we can quickly and immediately basically do mitigations to help out here and really minimize the blast radius because we already have prior knowledge and we have documented the prior knowledge so that we don't need to have the same on-caller or the same person responding to the alert because the information is easily accessible. Um, so that makes it a lot easier for us. Now, what are some takeaways? Um, the first takeaway is uh, obviously um, prevent Snowflake's Kubernetes clusters. I didn't um, mention this too much in the presentation so far, but it's really a learning we've also done with our customers and with security incidents um, with our customers. Really make sure that your clusters are aligned on the version they are running, on the version of Kubernetes they are running. Maybe if you're a Giant Swarm customer, on the version of um, Giant Swarm they are running. Um, because if you have certain clusters that for some reason you have treated as a snowflake and you're now afraid to touch, I will, I will put my hand on my heart and I will guarantee you that this cluster will be the first one to cause you security issues, to cause you ops issues and anything else under the sun, um, because it will not receive the same love as maybe the herd of other clusters you have. Especially when you're going to scale, these snowflake clusters become landmines. You can have security incidents in these clusters that are fixed in all your other clusters, but because it's a snowflake, you did not fix it. In previous iterations, there were maybe, or, or in, years back uh, there was a lot of talk of um, having virtual machines which are snowflakes but this is basically now moved on we have moved on from having snowflake machines in your data center to snowflake clusters in your kubernetes um, footprint so really go with the old mindset into the new technology and realize having a snowflake kubernetes cluster is probably the worst thing you can do to yourself the second takeaway is um, inter-team communication continues to be a big challenge. So even though I uh, presented several different ways on how we do it, how we do it with our customers, so internally and with a special interest group, with our customers with lots of communication, um, it is still a big issue. You will not solve this perfectly. There will have to be compromises to really enable you to have a security communication between your teams, which are all using Kubernetes. Um, because of how organizations are often structured, this can become extremely difficult just on an organization by organization basis. But the benefits are also extremely big. If you have this communication between your Kubernetes users in your organization, you can really align, you can take the maximum benefit out of Kubernetes and also on the security advancements in Kubernetes across your organization. So it continues to be a challenge, uh, is all I can say to that. And then finally, automation. Automation is really your strongest weapon you have in Kubernetes security. The levels you can automate to with Kubernetes and with all the 
different solutions that are available, some open source, some not open source, is really amazing by now. So it makes sense to really automate as much as you can. Really, if you're doing an action multiple times by hand, you should think about automating it or using a tool for it, especially in a security environment, because we all know that any manual action is error prone. Humans are very error prone and automating as much as possible will give you the biggest benefit you can think of.